Hey everybody, this is Mike, and uh, this is the first episode of the podcast for the Patreon campaign. I haven't come up with a name for it yet because I'm not exactly sure what it's going to be. Uh, I'm going to have guests, and this month my guest is going to be surprise, surprise, Tony Garcia. Uh, and I'm going to introduce him in a second, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about what this episode is going to be about. Uh, so in general, these podcasts are going to be about uh, game design. You know, if I have game designers on, we'll talk about what it is that we do. Uh, and when I have other people of, of other... Uh, professions on, I can ask them sort of how game design interfaces with them and what they can do to make uh, uh, that other person's job easier and vice versa. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm here with Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi, Mike. How, how's it going? Good. Good. You, I'm you, glad that people are going to finally get a chance to listen to us talk to each other. I know. It's been so... Uh, so long. It's, it's you know, it's a, it's a interaction that people don't get much. You know, you and I talking. <laughs> the back and forth. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, uh, I was thinking about that when I was, uh, coming up with an idea for a podcast and I thought, you know who we haven't heard from enough? <laughs> Tony Garcia. Uh, so, uh, for those of you who haven't listened to our, our useless podcasts before, Tony and I do a, a, a show in our spare time whenever both of us aren't busy. Uh, that's mostly about, our experiences making games and what it's like behind the curtain. And uh, this is going to be a little different from that. So those of you who are used to that, uh, you know, you can let me know what you think and see if you like this format. Uh, so, Tony, first off, uh, what I wanted to ask is what kind of interactions do you tend to... Do you want to put that... my uh, resume down for people? Yeah, actually, that's probably a good idea. Let's lay because... that down. That's for the people know. I worked hard on that resume. All right. Uh, why don't you go ahead and say your resume and I'll just chime in. Well, uh, so I was a programmer at uh, Insomniac. That well, My first job was a tester at Insomniac. Was what was I, that like at Insomniac? It was good. Good people. Really good people. Uh, so my first job was as a tester at Insomniac, uh, 2002, forever ago. Right, yeah. Long time ago. We're old. I know. We've seen the industry grow and change, Mike. Uh, uh, and then I moved on from that to be a programmer on uh, Ratchet... Two, three, and deadlocked. Right. Uh, from there, I worked at Blizzard for a short while. At Blizzard? What'd and you work on at Blizzard? I worked on uh, a little game. Not too many people have heard about it. It's one of their smaller, less successful games. Yeah, it was one of those ones that, you know, cult classic kind of game. Right. Called yeah. uh, World of Warcraft. Oh, I remember World of Warcraft. That was like 10 years ago. One of the few. One yeah. of the few. Uh, so I worked on Burning Crusade there. I had a little title. Some people liked it. So, you know, it was good. Yeah, I think I missed that one. It was a good experience. Okay. Uh, you know, when you work at those small studios, sometimes it's it's more just about learning the ropes and figuring out what it's like to work at a small place like yeah. this. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, uh, so after that, I imagine you wanted to go to a really big studio. Right. Giant studio uh, called uh, High Impact Games. Right. Right. Uh, worked on Spyborgs there. Yes. Yeah, with me. Huge game that I'm there. sure everybody has heard of. Yes. Uh, 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 that one probably more successful than World of What? <laughs> yes. World, uh, it's not important. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so then after that, uh, after being at such a big studio, uh, uh, what was next? Then I went to Double Fine okay. and worked on Stacking and The Cave. Okay. And uh, after that, I've been doing uh, indie projects. So, you, so you've been doing this programming thing for a while then? Uh, wow. It's probably been about... You know what? It's going to be 13 years on the dot. And you know how I know it's been 13 years on How's the dot? How's that? I, the call I got from Steph to announce that I got the job in Insomniac was on my birthday. On your birth? So um, your birthday is the first day of your career also? Yep. That's really convenient. It's really crazy, right? See, I don't remember my first day. I just remember it was in April of 2002. That's all I, I know just because I got the call. On my birthday, and I was telling her that it was an incredible birthday present she was giving me <laughs> to say that I got the job. And the funny thing is, uh, was I worked with Steph also at High Impact. We worked right. together there. And there was another thing. Something came up where I think I got the job at High Impact around the same time. And I was joking with Steph that the first time I talked to her, it was because she was giving me the job 
on my birthday. And in High Impact, I also started right around the same time. And I was like, we just have this way when we come together around my birthday, you offer me jobs. <laughs> That's not a bad connection. No, have. it's not bad. It yeah. works out pretty well. But it is very convenient in terms of marking the anniversary of when I started. Maybe 13 years. On the, uh, so it is coming up. So now it's 2015, started in 2002. Uh, right around my birthday, so it's going to be right around 13 long years in the game industry. So what what does being a programmer entail? Like, let's just assume that uh, someone listening to this has never heard of game programmer before. What do you do? Uh, so for the most part, uh, in the basic version is you're in charge of making sh- the designer's vision be something that the player can play and experience sort of realizing it like yeah. getting it into you're there to reality en- you, i mean and it's not even just designers you're there to enable all the other disciplines to basically be able to take what's in their head and realize it on screen i mean so because none of the other disciplines get to act until you've created the environment in which they act right right the, the code environment in right I mean, I mean there's also because programmers are also in charge of the tools the and engine. they're also in charge of the engine, and yeah. everything has to feed through programmers at some point to get into the game, just because it's... I mean, every, the knowledge is so specialized in every field that nobody can be expected to be able to do everything. Right. Uh, so... And this is especially true in, in the industry. Uh, you know, like, uh, in indie games, I mean, one person isn't specialized. They might be doing a dozen different hats, right? Right. But uh, for sure, I, I could back you up on that in... in in uh, uh, studio development, it is really specialized. Yeah. yeah. So you just have that one person that people... You have the programming department is basically where all the specialists funnel through to actually get it onto the screen. I think that's probably the easiest way to describe what it is to be a programmer. Because it, it varies from studio to studio, but that, that part's always pretty much the same. Is They are the, for lack of a better term, the bottleneck in the pipeline where the vision becomes... The reality of what the game is. If making a game, we're building a skyscraper, who would the programmers be in that process? Uh, construction workers, probably. Construction workers. That's so they're the ones doing the actual work to put That's everything right. together. The ones who are actually there on the ground, uh, putting the, you know, welding the, the beams together, the hammering des- the lumber. The designers are 100 miles away in their they're air the conditioned office, they're the architects. drawing the blueprints. Yeah, we come in and hang the curtains afterwards too, though. That's true. That's do right. That. Yeah. That's right. Uh, you know, and look disapprovingly at everything. That's that's our that's our other job. Uh, so so as uh, as a programmer, what was your uh, what was your specialty? You mentioned a whole bunch of different programming uh, specialties. I've done a couple things. Uh, I've done gameplay work and tools work. Really tiny bit of engine work. I use, mm-hmm. I'd only I pretty much only do engine work when it's a disaster. Uh, when you, you've got to roll your sleeves up, it's one well, of those. Well, it's, it's one of those things where a lot of times when you're working on something, you encounter a bug and you don't know exactly what it is. Right. And in the course of digging into the bug, you just keep going further and further down. The rabbit hole. And, turn, and then you find out <laughs> that it's actually in the engine. And then you're the guy who found it, so you're the guy that gets to fix it, right? <laughs> so that's that's the only time I ever end up really doing it's, engine work. It's the moose turd pie of programming. That's right, exactly. Uh, it's, if you complain about the cooking, you got to cook. That's right, exactly. Um, so uh, uh, so in your in your normal day to day, what kind of interface do you have with game designers? You know what? It goes. It's very different from studio to studio. I mean, sometimes uh, you have a lot of designers who want to be very hands on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and want to be involved in every step of the process to make sure that always that you know everything's going the way that they they see it done. I certainly met designers who are like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and who you know want to talk all the time and want to make sure and see how everything's going. Yeah. You have a lot of designers who are sort of more hands off and just sort of say, "Here's the basic idea. We'll talk again in a week and see where we are, and mm-hmm. then we'll readjust from there." Uh, and then you also have like and and Blizzard is one of those places where. Um, Blizzard's a very designer uh, central company. I've like, heard that about the designers them. really drive the product at Blizzard more than any other place that I've worked. Mm-hmm. And so the the programmers at Blizzard are really only there to uh, empower the designers who do most of the actual. Well, I don't want to disparage any of the programmers at Blizzard, but they do a lot of they do a lot more than other places that I've seen of the actual implementation 
of something that goes right into the game. And so a lot of pro, a lot of there is just sort of, you don't really talk to them too much about individual designs. It's just when they come to you, when they need, when they're like, our tools are lacking here. We need mm-hmm. to be able to do this. And then you sort of enable their tools. So you need to, so, you know, they need maybe to ex- extend something so that they can have vehicles in an expansion or something exactly. like that. Yeah. You're the, the, the programmers are the ones who make that happen. And the designers might make the specifics of the vehicle there. Right. Uh, how is that different than, say, uh, Double Fine? Double Fine is a little bit different just because this Double Fine is uh, very, very uh, stripped down in terms of designers. I okay. think at the time that I was there, uh, working on stacking and working on the cave, we pretty much had one designer on the whole project. Okay. And even, the, even though they're smaller projects for sure than some of the other games I worked on, it is still a small number of designers for a project of that scale. Uh, so did the programmers take on a lot of design duty? They did. Similar to how you were saying the designers at Blizzard would take on the programming duty? Exactly. So it was a little bit more programmer-driven company uh, at Double Fine, where the designers would, uh, would again, they would have a general idea, and they mm-hmm. would come to you and say, okay, here's how I expect this to play out. Uh, and even, but even then, uh, on stacking, the designs were actually fairly intricate. Right, and since yeah. it was a puzzle game, he really had laid it out. Sort of, here's how the puzzle is supposed to go, and you go here, 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 here. I've heard those games are a lot like writing a novel. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So it was very, so there wasn't a lot of room for interpretation in stacking because the puzzle had to play out a certain way. Right. So even though he didn't have to be there hands on every day, he was able to still very lay out a very clear vision as to how the design was supposed to play out. And so even though he didn't, so he didn't have to check in with the programmers all the time, but he could still be fairly confident that the designs were going to be... It, it was, was it's the only it. thing that, that made it work, so you could just have one designer. He would basically write the puzzles and then give it to us to implement the puzzles. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, so uh, I guess what the next question I have is, uh, so you identified kind of two groups of designers mainly, right? There's the designers who, uh, who, who, who come to design... Uh, with a design, and there's the designers who come to design looking for a design. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And, uh, and it sounds like it's 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 sort of a different experience working with each yes, group. Yes, absolutely. Is there anything um, in terms of those game designers that they could do to make it easier for you to work with them? Well, you know what? So much of it depends on... Uh, in, the, uh, in the second case, the designer who comes looking for a design. Sure. That's a relationship that really... It's a... It's a difficult relationship to foster because there's yeah. so much give and take. Uh, because when you're working in that way, it's much more of a collaborative process where you're both feeling out what's sort of going on. And it requires you to have a very good relationship with them where you can actually express your opinions and know that you're being listened to and have them talk to you and know, and know that you're listening to them. Right. Yeah. And if you have a breakdown in that communication, it can get it can get very contentious very fast, and it can sort of foster into a really bad, you know, experience that where nobody is happy and nobody feels like either side is giving any any leeway. And it's definitely a more difficult, uh, well, potentially difficult um, relationship to to manage. But it's also mm-hmm. rewarding when it works, and you you know you're on the same page because you get, see more of yourself in. In your as, work. as a programmer, you right. end up seeing yeah. more of yourself. Now, I've had uh, uh, you know artists or or programmers in the past who have enjoyed working with one of the two disciplines more. Do you think that that has something to do with what you were talking about the 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 different communication requirements from each group? Like uh, you're sent the the one who wants more collaboration, right? Uh, needs to be more willing to almost over communicate with uh with that person on a daily basis whereas the other person has to be very capable of coming up with what they need up front right right and then making sure that that that's getting ticked off and constantly comparing that to what they want and adjusting and stuff like it sounds like it's a very different style of communication yeah absolutely i mean i think there's also i think programmers have a reputation in our industry fair or not Mm -hmm. uh of being Poor communicators. I've I've have heard that stereotype from people. In general, 
I haven't seen that to be the case, but I know what you're talking. I've met a few about it. You, I've met a few you, programmers you who are like that. Yeah. Talk to, you, you, when you talk to some designers, when I'm new at a place and I talk to designers, they always have these horror stories of people that <laughs> they worked little, with. Little afraid of the programmer. Or yeah, something. exactly. Yeah. Of just being like, oh, that guy was just he was so hard to talk to, and mm-hmm. he didn't communicate very well. And it's just it's this reputation that's born out of something. I don't know where it is, but it uh-huh. but it is in, it's in the industry and it's real. I know I've I've met maybe a, a few programmers who are like that, so I can see maybe where it came from. But yeah, I, I know what you're saying. It's not. It's probably more of a stereotype than it yeah. is. A, yeah. So and there's definitely when you're new to some place, there's definitely the uh, fear when you're working with artists and designers of, for the first time. Is yeah. he going to be one of those people oh, yeah. that? you know, really listens and who I can really talk to and who really understand? Or is he going to be very dismissive of, because there's definitely those people out there, but they're out there in all disciplines. But the problem is, I think the reason programmers get that attitude is if a designer is dismissive of everybody else, then his work's just not going to get done. Right. Yeah. Right? Cause <laughs> I mean, obviously he yeah. needs to talk to people. That's his job is yeah. communicating. Unless he's, you know, at Blizzard, one of those people who, really actually implements his own work. Right, yeah. It's not going to get done. Artists, same way. Everybody has to talk to a programmer to get their stuff done. A programmer doesn't need an, an artist to do his work. A programmer right. doesn't need a designer to do his work. So he can be dismissive of people and still get things done. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily well, right. but he, he can come in 9 to 5 every day, not listen to anybody, but still have plenty of work to do. Mm-hmm. Right, and just right. be like, you know, I'm just I'm grinding away on the engine. This is all me. I don't need to talk to anybody, so I'm not going to listen to anybody, and I'm just going to do my work. So they're one of the few. They're one of the few people in the industry who's in that position where they, they can, can get away with not yeah. sort of being collaborative mm-hmm. with the team. Uh, it's definitely not the best way to handle things, but it's def- but. What other what other position in game design just really has that? Maybe the producers. Maybe well, the producers are all I mean, about just talking. well. Their whole job is communicating. But I've seen you know dysfunctional producers whose job who who deal with it as uh, they use the channels of communication to uh, uh, enforce what they're looking for. Do you know what I mean? Right. The uh, mysteriously the channels of communication with the people they disagree with fall short. Uh, like I've I've seen that occasionally, but it's not just because they have the ability. It's usually because. They're trying to get around something, right? You know? But I'm, so, uh, and again, that's the minority of producers. I'm not saying that's what producers are right. like. Yeah, but so I think I think I think the stereotype is born out of. I think because in a studio you can have that programmer who's very tough to to deal with, mm-hmm. but at the same time is invaluable to the company. Right. Yeah. Who uh, uh, who might not want to listen to. Feedback, right? Unless they really, really solidly agree with it. So they have a lot of power in that sense. But also everything that they do is pretty amazing. So you, you want to give them a right. bit of room. Is that sort of what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. And, but you don't, I've never met that designer who doesn't have people skills who you need. Right. Right. right? I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Probably the same with the producer now. Yeah. That, yeah. That you need them. So there's plenty of programmers who are like, okay, maybe he doesn't have the best people skills, but his job doesn't require people skills. I see. But if you have a designer who doesn't have people skills, their job kind of requires people skills. Same with artists, same with producers. Pretty much all the other disciplines require a level of being able to deal with people. But there are definitely some aspects of programming jobs where it doesn't matter if mm-hmm. you're very, a very good communicator. You, the, you know, that's not your job. And then I suppose the dark side of that is... Uh, uh Using that power to get what you want at the expense of somebody else. Right. Uh, I know I've met some programmers like that where uh, uh, they'll tell me something is impossible. But since I, I'm also a pro, I've been programming since I was nine years old. I can tell when they're, when it's actually impossible, uh-huh. right? They'll rattle off something and I'll be like, oh yeah, of course, that would be impossible. I'll come up with something else. And then it's just like, no, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't fly a camera to the left of this. Right. That would be impossible. I'm like, well, you just sort of push it over the left. Like, right. you want me to do it for you? So that, I mean, I think, to get back to what we were talking yeah, about, yeah, yeah. I think that's sort of where, so the, that when you go into collaborative designs, mm-hmm. there's always that fear of, is this going to be one of those guys mm, I see. who is going to give me a hard time every step of the way because he doesn't need me and he knows it? Or is it going to be one of those people who's willing to do a little bit of give, give and take? And is willing to, 
Because, you know, that's really what it comes down to in a lot of these things. If the designer wants to work collaboratively with the programmer, mm-hmm. but the programmer doesn't want to have anything to do with it, I don't know what the designer is supposed to do in that situation. It's not an easy situation, yeah. Uh, so, has there been a situation where uh, you've had difficulty communicating with a designer and either you or the designer has done something unusual that helped that? Can you think of anything like that? Well, I like working. I like working very closely with people. Yeah, uh, I, I've I, noticed that about I you. Yeah. People, I really like sort of understanding where they're coming from and where they and where they go and sort of what their rationale is, and not in terms of wanting to question them, just knowing sort of where they're coming from. Yeah. I think it helps me understand better sort of why they do the things that they do. So it's not a, so. I definitely had situations. I, the situation that comes up more, more for me is. I want to sit there and talk to the designer about everything, and they just don't have time for mm, me. Okay. Because that's the reality, especially at a place like Double Fine where we had just the one designer on the Right, whole he was serving the whole team. Like, how much time do I really have to sit down with him and ask him, okay, can you please just walk me through everything? Right. And he's like, really? I don't have time to walk you through every little step of the way. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the situation that's more common for me than the other way because I like it when I – and I could talk to them every day and, mm-hmm. and ask them, come up to them questions. So the thing that bothers me more is more just sort of like when the designer is just overloaded with work and he's just like, I don't have time for this. Just figure it out and just do what you want to do. Uh, and the horror story from there is, uh, uh, in that direction is, of course, when they do come to you and it's just like, this is not what oh. I had in mind. Oh, what is going on? What happened? After not doing what was necessary to get what they want, coming back and being like, I didn't get what I want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, I see what you mean. Yeah. So p- part of my job for a long time when I was working publisher side was to sort of go in to a developer and see kind of where the bottlenecks are, you know, and, mm-hmm. and where people aren't communicating and stuff like that. And um, generally when we'd see a designer who was in that situation, right, where they were necessary – and there was not enough of that one person, him, him or her, to get around to everybody else. That would be the circumstance where it was like, okay, we need to hire some more people, mm-hmm. right? Like there was always a personnel reason that that person was sort of underserved and not much that the programmer or the designer could do. I mean, does that sound sort of accurate? Like when you get into that situation, is there, is there not much that, that can be done besides personnel? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's weird. I mean, there's sometimes where there, the personnel problems are only scalable up to a point. There mm-hmm. becomes a point where adding new people isn't that right. useful. Nine people can't certain... have a baby in one month. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's a good way to put it. Uh, so there's definitely things like that, but it's, it's also the, um, what is it? The, uh, your, your bus number, I think is what people call it. The, uh, uh, what's the context? The, uh, the idea of if you had these people, and they all died in a car crash. Oh, in a plane crash. Or whatever. Like, how many people can you afford to, to lose and not be completely crippled? Okay. Like, there are some places where that guy, it's one guy. Like, if that one guy <laughs> was to just sort of disappear, you're completely crippled because he was the guy at all. And it's... I have heard that about a few studios. Yeah, that there's there's usually one person who is holding the whole thing together. They're like the Mother Teresa of that studio. Yeah. Right? And when they go away, And when knows? you're in that sort of situation... Adding more people doesn't help. It's more about distributing the knowledge and distributing the workload that you really need to do more than than just bring on somebody. Well, one thing I've noticed uh, that we would find out in those situations where we, we would have someone like that, right? The creative genius person at the company who needed to only be interfacing creatively with the entire team. Uh, so what we would do in that case is hire people to take every other responsibility from that person, right? That person would not schedule their own day. That person would not uh, uh, be doing any paperwork for their human... Re- they, there would be people who would be paid to do that for that person so that that one person could, you know, have... But that, I found that that, uh, uh, that was sort of an extreme case, you know, like where you have to hire people to, to, to right. babysit a person. Yeah. Just so that, but usually it ends up being worth the money. But I mean, enough. a lot of the times those situations are born out of control and you have people mm-hmm. who are just unwilling to, to give up power. Right. 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 And who, who like being. Or who are terrified of it. Yeah. Right. And who like being that one guy that everybody has to go through. Um, that's when you hire more people and force them. To work <laughs> like we've, we had that circumstance a few times too, where it's just like, 
Well, yeah, it would be hard for you to teach this to another person, but if you got hit by a bus, we'd be screwed, so do it anyway. Right, exactly. And then there are the other people where there's really not much you can do to give them more hours in their day besides taking some stuff off their, you know, someone who buys them lunch, even, you know? Yeah. Like, I heard a story once about, uh, so there was a meeting between all the executives at Microsoft, and this isn't Microsoft Games, this is everybody at Microsoft, mm-hmm. right? Where all of these people who were making hundreds of thousand dollar, of dollars a year, right? Uh, who were all waiting for one hour, right? Can you imagine how much money they're spending right. to get 30 or 40 of these executives just to wait for an hour? Because during that one hour window, at some point, Bill Gates would come in and talk for 10 minutes. <laughs> and here's the thing that, uh, that the person who told me the story told me. They ran the numbers and that was way more efficient than wasting a single minute of Bill's time. Really? Because he wow. was, because, uh, they they actually had a, a whole number of people who were hired to to grease those wheels just so that he would have that a ten minute window yeah. at some point in the hour exactly and that that was it was more efficient to have those people waiting for that hour than it would be to have him have to shift his schedule in any direction wow. to, and it when you actually really have a person like that who who is the mother Teresa of that organization it gets kind of hard to do anything else yeah yeah I mean who are you going to hire to start Gaining Bill Gates' knowledge. Right. That's a tough, that's a tough <laughs> job listing exactly. to put on your website. And, you know, some companies really do have that Bill Gates figure who is almost necessary. And you, you got to try, you got to start getting him apprentices. Well, Double Fine is, a, a, Double Fine is a good point. example of, uh, when you look at Broken Age, mm-hmm. that all comes, that all starts at Tim. Mm-hmm. Tim is, uh, the soul of that game company. That's what I've heard. Yeah, uh, and seen so, from the, the videos. And so even even though he's not a bottleneck uh-huh. in any way, shape, or form, he is a very, very important part of what makes the Double Fine game a Double Fine game. His attention is a you know, key his, his, piece, t- yeah. his attention, his personality. It's mm-hmm. just everything. It's a, it's everything that is him. Right. Is, okay. You see it in his games. Right. And that's the thing that's more. That's that's one of the things that's so amazing is that. If you play Double Fine games, you get this real sense that you know Tim. You right. You know how he is. Right. I see what you and mean. And in a lot yeah. of ways, that holds up. He is the guy that you think he is that, that come from his games. And there's no, there's no way to teach that to somebody else. Right. right. Yeah, I see what you mean. To lose Tim would make those games remarkably different. You would have to have someone who made, who, who, would make something different. Right. As well is basically the best you could probably do at that case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, and you're kind of you're kind of in a a spot there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh but uh so in in your experience does that also tend to happen with that programmer? You know, the genius programmer like we were just talking about Bill Gates. Uh you know like we like Al at Insomniac was uh while we were there he was the the linchpin of that uh, technology apparatus, right? Uh, there were lots of other people who were instrumental and couldn't, the game couldn't have been made without. Sure. But Al was kind of, like, he felt like he was a, a stone that, that things were built upon. If he was not there, the games would not have been made. Right. He right. was definitely one impression. of those people. If we lose Al, we are screwed. Do you see that, uh, often or, or, or more than once? There's definitely the guy. There's all, there's always that one programmer. Who you're like, wow, uh, <laughs> nobody, I don't know anybody else that can do what he does at this company. Just because a lot, he, cause they hold a lot of sort of arcane, archaic knowledge that they've only been able to figure out from, you know, tales of having worked at the company for so long. <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, and it's one of those things where the, the, that, that's a very interesting situation just because a lot of their work tends to be largely invisible. Um, That's like how true, many yeah. people at Insomniac really knew what Al did? I don't know. I mean, beyond three or four people on the engine team who could have like articulated at all what it was he was working on. Right. Yeah. I mean, I certainly had no idea. Most you of had, time. you had an, you knew that he was important, but not a lot of people knew how important what he was actually doing. That too. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know what Al's day to day was. I have no idea what Al's day to day was. I imagined a I'm lot sure of it was, was an incredibly important day every day, though. Computer telepathy, I imagine, <laughs> yeah. was most of the day. Um, but like when you have, uh, 
when you have a designer who's doing a lot of forward facing work, and that's mm-hmm. the thing, designers do a lot of forward facing work, programmers right. tend to do a lot of backwards facing work. Uh, it's very easy to say, oh, I, I, I see what the, I can see what they're doing. I can see what an artist is producing. I can see what they're making. But a programmer, a lot of that stuff you, you can't see. Mm-hmm. Like they can come to you and say, what'd you do this week? Well, oh, I optimized our graphics renderer by 10%. And you just kind of have to like, great. I'll see, take you, you at your word. See, if you're, if you're a programmer, right, or an artist who wants something to be more beautiful in an area, but couldn't because the frame rate was dropping or something, you get a giant buzz from hearing right. that he just, in, you, yeah, we he can, or she, I we guess. We can push 10,000 more polygons yeah. a frame now. You're like, okay, that sounds awesome. But if you're a player, how do you even come to understand what that means to your end experience? Right. Yeah, I see what you, I mean, that's where you get into that, that IGN quote about Warren Spector, right? Yes, the famous one. The, uh, let's see, how did it go? Um, games are often attributed to only one person, said Warren Spector, the creator of Deus Ex. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was, uh, I mean, in that, that there, there generally are those forward facing people. And a lot of the times it does seem to be that they're designers. Yeah. I mean, it's just sort of, it's easier that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, it makes, you can actually talk about your thought process that goes into sort of a level design. It's harder to talk about, well, not harder. It's le- it's considerably less interesting to talk about. <laughs> to a layperson. To a layperson about uh, how, why you designed your uh, renderer the way that you did. Right. Or your right? state machine or right, why exactly. yours was different than Carl Glaive's, for example. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's yeah. definitely like thoughts of book on, uh, I was actually talking to somebody recently about matchmaking systems. Okay. And uh, it's just one of those things where we were talking about matchmaking in ter- terms of what games have done it well and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, there is so much literature about matchmaking systems. Yeah. You could read, you could have a new book every day for a year and to just learn about matchmaking systems. That was the case seven years ago. I imagine it's even worse now. It's not a sexy topic, though. No. <laughs> like, who really wants to? Who really wants to hear? Uh, how much podcast information could you get if this was a matchmaking system podcast? If if you yeah. were into it, we could make a ton of content about it. But like in terms of what people would actually be interested in, right? Come on, how much well, content can we really produce? You'd have to be fairly. Uh, uh, you have to be fairly talented, I think, to turn ELO rankings into something that someone would want to listen to on a podcast. Right, right? yeah. And I mean, even saying ELO rankings, I'm sure like nine people fell but asleep. It's, but it's incredibly important work. So important. When you're working on yeah. a multiplayer game, that matchmaking system is what holds it all together. It's the first thing that people are going to experience about your multiplayer game. And even then, people people might not notice that what is ruining their multiplayer experience is a bad matchmaking, matchmaking system. <laughs> yeah. Right? They just... And it's one of those things where it's inv- it's invisible work. The, like people have no idea how much research goes in. It's not oh, like you just yeah. put in a matchmaking system. No, you have to research that topic. <laughs> you have to have meetings about what <laughs> yeah. algorithm of matchmaking you're going to yeah. use. There is so much work that goes into it. And politics. And politics. And politics. I'm... It's just sort of nobody knows because it's not yeah. forward-facing work. It's designed to be hidden. It's stuff that you're not supposed to see. Right. Yeah. And that's, is that, uh, is that hard? Like being, being it can on... be hard. I mean, one of the big things about working on World of Warcraft, uh, especially coming from Insomniac is I was definitely working on more back end systems at Blizzard than I was at Insomniac. Cause Insomniac, you were doing levels and monsters and right. like all, all stuff that players touch. Um, and this is sort of, this is, this, I'm going to sidetrack for a second. One of the things that was great about working on World of Warcraft that was uh, really amazing and an experience I'm glad that I had mm-hmm. was at the time, World of Warcraft was the game. Yeah. Like, that was the game that people associated with video games. <laughs> uh, when we were working in Insomniac, it was Grand Theft Auto 3. Yeah. Grand, it was like when you told people, what do you, like people that, what do you do? Oh, I work on video games. Oh, do you work on Grand Theft Auto? No, I don't work on Grand Theft Auto. That or Halo. It was or one Halo. of those two. Yeah, Halo was yeah. one of those. But World of Warcraft was the game at the time where you talk to people and like, what do you do? Oh, I work on video games. Oh, do you know that game, World of Warcraft? Yes, I do know that game, World of Warcraft. As a matter of fact. Uh, but the problem was people would then ask, oh, what did you make? And I'd be like, I can't really explain it to you. Oh, yeah. What I made, right? Right. Nothing that you've actually seen. I can't point to anything and be like, I made that. 
on Ratchet, I could point to that and be like, I made that. That was the thing that I made. But you could really only point to everything. Right, when exactly. It the wild. I'm You're like, like, I have a little bit to do with all of that. <laughs> so you see that armor on that guy? I made a thing that lets the artist look at that thing before it goes into the game so they can iterate on it faster so then when we do put it in the game we don't have to waste a lot of time doing that doesn't nobody right, cares right, right? right nobody cares that when i say that that's what i it's true did on world of it's Warcraft. true it's true people... but it's important yeah to have that system where you can actually preview an item before not, without having to make a build oh my god how well, important is that because if it takes too long to make you can't have as much of it exactly right uh yeah so exactly. so it's it's hard in that way in terms of like when you talk to people and then what do you do? Yeah. Uh, you do, especially for video games where people assume that if you work in video games, either, uh, you just play video games all day or, you know, you're the, or the all video games are made by like a guy. Right. right? That's what people assume. Right. One person doing the whole thing. Right. So you're like, Oh, I work on video games. Oh, so you must have done everything. Did um, you do Halo? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so when you can't when we, and so it becomes very difficult to explain to people what I do on a game where I don't have a lot of forward facing work on the project. So this is going to now have to be a question I ask to every discipline uh-huh. because, uh, like, how do you explain what you do to lay people? <laughs> because, I'm glad I've given you a question. Well, because because check this out, I would give almost the same answer you gave when people ask me what I did on a game because they're like, oh, what did you do? Right? Uh-huh. I'm like, the level. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? Well, you see how that guy's there? I decided he should be there. Right, exactly. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's really hard. Yeah. Uh, you know, I could be like, I sprinkled the fairy dust all over this whole section of the game. Yeah. It's not easy. I, like, I'm wondering if maybe every discipline feels that way to one degree. I think audio people have it easy. You think so? Because they, audio. they make audio. Right. Right. I mean, I suppose then it might be like, oh, do you get to work with actors well, maybe not or do you all, make music? Yeah, or? the music people probably have it the easiest. As opposed to the sound effects As people. opposed to the sound effects people. They probably but like, have it hard. But artists, like, what though, you, how hard could it be to be an artist? You're like, yeah, I drew the thing. The sound, there was, um, in, uh, in Ratchet and Clank 2, we had those sort of, uh, those bog monsters that fired like green slime balls or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I spent like two days working on that effect. And at, when I was finally done with it, I had to sit back and I was like, four years of college <laughs> to make a snot effect. <laughs> and so I imagine a lot of sound people are the same way where you have like, when they have to do like fart sounds or something, they just have, they have that moment where they're just like, what am I doing? I'm so much better than this, but at the same time. I'm not better than this. Of course, you also get those sound designers who get really excited about <laughs> yeah, the fart noises. So. They're just like, thank God it's not, I need a clip over and over again. <laughs> so I imagine a lot of sound designers have that. Well, what do you do? Oh, I made the fart sounds <laughs> in uh, Conker's Bad Fur Day. All those poop sounds that come when you're fighting the Great Mighty Poo, that was me. Which, in fairness, is 90% of Conker's Bad Fur Day. A- absolutely. Yeah. That, so- that song... Is amazing, but at the same time, somebody is out there. What do you do? I wrote this song about this giant sh- singing about how he's going to eat you and sh- you out. That person is Weird Al Yankovic. Actually, <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not joking. Did he write that song? He did it uncredited. Yeah, really? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's crazy. So apparently that was him. But uh, uh, on the, I think on that note, on the note of farts. Is where I need to end the podcast because if we get any high brow, we'll okay. start talking about ELO ratings and I'll lose my whole All audience. Right. So, uh, do you have any final words you want to say? Anything you want to plug? Anything like that you want to do no, uh, for the end of the I'm, podcast? No, I know it's not exciting. That's cool. I'm just, I'm just here to help out, have a conversation, see how we, you know, uh, congratulate you on your, uh, on your Patreon. I Thank haven't, you. I haven't given you a public congratulations oh, at least on your Patreon. Yeah. So, congratulations, Mike. I'm glad that this is working out for you. I'm glad Thanks. that we. Uh, I was here to work on your inaugural podcast. Maybe help you set a tone, a direction. Yes. About fart jokes and poo. Everyone will have to follow your act now. That's right. With fartier jokes and pooier <laughs> jokes. That's right. Until eventually this podcast is nothing but. Yeah. Over. Well, that's a good, that's a good one. Then when people ask you what you do. I, I run do, the Howard Stern show. I do. <laughs> I do a half an hour podcast, which is just me farting into a microphone. <laughs> and I could be proud of that. I think. 
All right. Well, thank you very much, Tony. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Mike.